Thank you. So I'm Pablo Azar, and I'm going to tell you about rational proofs. And this is joint work with Silvia Michali. Rational proofs are a type of interactive proof. And the central question in interactive proofs is for which problems can we give efficient interactive proofs? And by efficient, I mean that have few rounds, limited communication, and that can be verified in a limited amount of time. So these types of interactions were defined in the 80s by Goldwasser, Mikali, and Rakoff, and by Babay and Moran. So they defined the classes IP of interactive proofs. So you have, this is a set of languages, and the language can be decided by um, polynomially many rounds of interaction. And the proof that this expert Merlin gives can be verified by the user Arthur in polynomial time. And Arthur Merlin is with constantly many rounds. And in the late 80s, there was a lot of development to see what kind of problems could be decided with this type of interactive proofs. And there was a lot of work that culminated with the proof that IP equals P space. So any language in P space could be decided with one of these proofs. Now, this is a great story for all of these very, very complicated problems. You could have a very limited user asking a very powerful expert to solve the problems for them. And we could trust that the expert was giving us the right answer because of verification. It's a great story, but I'm going to tell you a different story. And our story happens many centuries later. So one day, Arthur comes to Merlin and says, solve this problem for me. Is this input x in this language l? Just like we've done hundreds of times before all through these centuries. But this day, Merlin says, go to hell. I'm not going to solve any more problems for you. Arthur, recovering from some shock, says, I thought we were friends. Why are you doing this to me? And Merlin, after catching his breath, explains that all his friends from grad school, Dumbledore, Gandalf, Harry Potter, they all went work for these Wall Street banks. And they're making a lot of money. And Merlin says, if you want me to keep proving theorems for you, you might as well pay me. You're a king. You're loaded with money. Fine. Proving will resume, and Merlin will get paid. But now, because of this betrayal by Merlin, Arthur says, I trust you even less. So if you give me a correct proof for a theorem, I'll pay you a dollar. But if you cheat me and I can't verify your proof, I pay you zero dollars. And proving went on as usual for a few days. And Arthur and Merlin could prove any problems in p-space in polynomially many rounds and any problems in the Arthur-Merlin class in constantly many rounds. Now, in this setting, Merlin only cared about money, and Arthur had an idea. And he asked himself, now that I only need to pay Merlin, and he'll be happy as long as I pay him, can I use this to prove more theorems and can I prove them faster? Can I leverage Merlin's rationality in order to do better? And in particular, because he was very tired of having to interact with Merlin polynomially many times and do all these computations with polynomials over finite fields, he asked, can we do fewer rounds? So the central question in this talk is going to be, what's the largest class of problems for which we can guarantee the correctness of the solution to the problem using monetary incentives. Now, this is a theoretical computer science talk. I have to rigorously define what this class of problems means. And it's going to be a set of languages that we call rational Merlin Arthur. So as with the classical interactions, there's a very limited polynomial time user called Arthur and an infinitely powerful expert called Merlin. And we say that this a language L belongs in this set. 
if and only if it has associated two functions, an output function pi, which is a polynomial time function, and a reward function r, which is also polynomial time. And syntactically, what's going to happen is, given an input x, there's going to be some interaction between Arthur and Merlin. So Merlin sends some message y1, and Arthur sends some random coins r1 to Merlin, as in the classical interaction with Arthur Merlin. Merlin sends a message y2, Arthur sends some more random coins, and so on, and they generate a transcript. No, we don't. So, um, so you're defining the public I'm defining the public coin model, and our results are for public coin models. Um, so they generate this transcript, and syntactically, Merlin is going to get some reward that depends on the problem they're trying to solve, x, and the transcript. And Arthur gets some output that also depends on the problem and on the conversation with Merlin. And so far, this is all syntactic. I haven't told you what the desirable behavior of the players is. But one thing that I'm going to point out is that there's going to be no verification in our model. So the fact that he gets his output doesn't mean that he's verifying that Merlin isn't cheating him. So what's desirable behavior in this rational model? Remember that we're assuming that Merlin has money in his mind. And this is basically like a game. So Merlin wants to maximize this reward of x and the transcript that he gets. And because it is a game, we have to look at the space of actions he can take. What he can control are his messages y1, y2, yn that he sends. And since Arthur in this model is always honest, as in classical Merlin-Arthur games, he trusts Arthur to send random coins R1, R2. So he knows exactly the distribution of Arthur's messages, and he can control his messages. So he essentially controls the whole transcript. And he's going to choose a transcript to maximize his expected reward. Now, that's what Merlin gets. He gets money out of this. Arthur better get something from this interaction as well. And remember, all that he wants is to know whether x is in the language or not. So it better be that if Merlin is maximizing his money, that Arthur learns something about the language from the transcript that maximizes Merlin's money. So if Merlin says t star, then Arthur's output on transcript t star better tell him whether x is in the language or not. So that's an informal definition. When I go to the proofs, I will give a formal definition of what this lang of what this complexity class is. Any questions so far? Yeah. yeah. Uh, is it possible that so there will be a tie? Right. So uh, maybe Merlin can maximize his, uh, his profit with uh, one transcript that has this property and another that doesn't. Yeah. So our con our constructions and our definitions. So our definitions will have the strictness property that we we'll want a unique transcript, and our constructions will satisfy that. But one thing to note that we didn't explore in the paper that was pointed at the previous seminar is that you don't need in the definition for there to be a unique transcript as long as all the transcripts in the tie yeah, true, satisfy this property. So, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's the characteristic function of a language. Great, so we gave this informal definition of this class, Rational Merlin Arthur, or RMA for short. And we can rephrase our central question as, where does this RMA fit? So we have this, we have this interesting space of all these different complexity classes, and it's possible that um, rational Merlin Arthur is very, very low in the polynomial hierarchy, like classical Merlin Arthur. Um, or it could be somewhere inside P space, like interactive proofs. Or we could, we could do much better than P space. Maybe we can do non deterministic exponential space. So, for example, the 
um, related model of refereed games um, obtains non-deterministic exponential space when there are two experts that we can play against each other. Here we're only going to have one expert, so we, can, we really have no verification. Yeah, so, so yeah, so anything that you can do with classical interactive proofs, I can do an interactive proof and pay you one dollar if it verifies and zero if it doesn't. Um, one thing that we're going to wonder is about how many rounds you can get. Yeah. Um, you might try to give a proof that only shows you the maximum to get the reward, and then uh, it's not rational. But, uh, yeah, but other, it's rational because you, you, you have to, to, I mean, Arthur will have to ask again and say again to get the right. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a different. You're giving away something, right? Um, it's, a, it's a different model where Merlin also has utility over Arthur learning the answer. Um, here, Arthur what you're suggesting, bec because there's no verification, Arthur has to believe that he got the right answer. It's not like he's going to go to Merlin again and, and notice that he got the wrong answer. And then we'll see that clearly when we um, construct these proofs um, for counting problems. You're not going to be able to tell that you got the wrong answer. You're going to have to trust Merlin's rationality yeah, that you got the right one. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's not like it's not like Merlin can induce Arthur to come again and pay again. Yeah, we should think of it as a one-stop thing. Yeah, um, there, and when there's many rounds, there's also going to be a formal definition of um, what it is. Okay, but as, as Anchor suggested, um, for IP, you should be able to give um, rational proofs with polynomially many rounds for any problem in p-space because I can pay you a dollar. And so now that I'm going to tell you that we can give rational proofs for sharp p, the, there is this question mark, because obviously I can give you a rational proof with polynomially many rounds of interaction. And one thing that we would really like to do in the classical model is to reduce this amount of rounds of interaction. And in particular, I'm a, I'm a theorist, but my, my systems friends tell me that um, bandwidth and interaction over the network is really expensive. So I can send you a lot of communication, I can send you a gigabyte file, but I can't meet with you um, a million times in order to talk about this problem. So we would really like to have proofs for Sharpie that take square root of n rounds or log n rounds or 64 rounds. And we're going to get a very short um, interactive proof for Sharpie. And we're going to get a one round interactive <laughs> proof for Sharpie. So as few interactions as possible. And uh, I want to remark that this is not true for classical Merlin Arthur proofs unless the polynomial hierarchy collapses. So Merlin Arthur proofs are very, very low in the polynomial hierarchy. And there are a lot of um, related <coughs> results that show that if this was the case, then really bad complexity implications would happen. Or really good, depending on your perspective. OK, this is our first theorem. And to show it to you, I have to <laughs> formally define for you what these rational Merlin Arthur proofs are. I'm going to recall some definition of sharp e to set notation and make the proof easier to digest. And I'm going to prove a theorem for you. So the intuition for one round rational proofs is very simple. And it's going to help us understand the formal definition. And I'm going to define them for function, for functions, because I'm comparing this to sharp e, which is a function class. So again, for any function f, Arthur wants to know the value of f of x. And he has associated a reward function r and a, an output function pi. So Merlin gives him a transcript y. And given Merlin's transcript and the problem we're trying to solve, Arthur sends some reward r of x, y. And Merlin's going to choose a transcript y that maximizes his expected reward. 
where the expectation now is over the randomness of this reward. So randomness is going to be really crucial here. I'm going to take a tangent from this. If this reward was not random, the language I'm defining is NP optimization problems, which are basically reducible to NP. So the fact that we're doing this random reward is going to give us a lot more power. And it better, as I said, Merlin chooses Y star to maximize his expected reward. And it better be that when he says the transcript Y star, Merle, Arthur can use the certificate in order to compute his assert function. Where, where does the randomness, the randomness comes from the reward. So, where does the randomness oh, so, so Arthur's going to, given, given Merlin's message, Arthur is going to um, flip some coins and uh, give him a reward that depends on the coins he flipped and on the message that Merlin gave. So what if the reward function is required to only output from you know, a small discrete set of values? Then this becomes much less powerful, right? Yes. So one, one key here is that the reward function um, is, is in a bound. It's a polynomially many values. Yeah. Right? Okay. Um, but this is going to have uh, interesting implications. Um, okay. I mean, yeah. I just yeah. So yeah, the fact that the reward is on a continuous set um, is, is crucial here. OK, this is the informal definition. The formal definition is basically the same thing written in sentences for those of you who like formal definitions. So we say that a function has a one round rational Merlin Arthur proof if there exists a polynomial, but more importantly, a reward function such that for every input x, there exists a unique certificate y of this polynomial length, maximizing the expected reward, and a, a function pi such that when this unique certificate y star, you get the function. So now I have to prove this for you. And remember that sharp p is a set of functions. And the inputs to these functions are going to be a non-deterministic Turing machine M, polynomial time Turing machine M, that takes as input some x and some y. And I'm also going to give you the x. And the output of a Sharpie function is, given this x, how many branches in this non-deterministic polynomial time Turing machine accept the input x? So how many green boxes are there in this picture? And for, yeah. Um, I, I didn't say that. I didn't say it, it implied that you could randomly reduce NP. No, no, I'm saying that. Oh, yeah. Why doesn't it imply that? Well, what is the amount? Why is it? So it's not on this definition. I, I can't remember. Yeah. Um, wh wh what I said with, with NP is that if, if, this, if this reward wasn't randomized, yeah, then it's, it's basically so a definition of NP. I can't remember the Yeah. Yeah, and we, ha we have noticed this. And I can also take offline. Um, we, we have noticed this, and we have, um, there's still some very interesting implications of this model, um, even taking that into account. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah. I, I, I was just saying, first of all, why it doesn't appear as the same. Oh, I see. Okay. So there's some money which is given in, in for maximizing. Yeah. Um, yes, it's a rational number, and it has polynomial in many bits. So uh, would this work if, for instance, you, your reward function was just two types? So what, you get some reward for convincing the convincing author, and some reward for R of x, maximizing x. So like equal reward, classic. No, R, R is the reward. No, but there's a reward also for satisfying author. 
no. Um, but Arthur, um, I'm, I'm going to say this many times, but Arthur cannot verify um, that Marlene's giving him the correct answer. So um, if I can give a, a, a pithy quote from Alan Smith, it's basically, um, it's not out of the kindness of the baker that we trust that he's not giving us poisoned bread. Um, it's because we trust the baker's self-interest. And um, so that's what's the conceptual innovation in this model. Um, so I'm not looking over your shoulder and checking that all your computations are correct. I'm paying you and trusting that you you like getting paid and you won't you know go for a walk in the park while you should be doing your job um, yeah one, one thing about what what you asked which is this reward function can actually only take two values at least for a proof of PP but the thing is it's it's randomized um, so I can pay you I one see. or zero with different probabilities I so see. It, I see. it's the coins that are going to give us this exponentially uh, many and values, yeah, okay. yeah. So you have to have some sort of collapsing. Yeah. Of so um, when when I get you the proof of PP, um, if I get you that, it's in the appendix. But basically, we can talk about very simple reward that gives you that. Yes. So we're, we're going to we're going to need fundamental time. Yeah. We're go, we're going to yeah. So yeah, we're going to assume the expectation is exact, and part of this I, I mean this is important because it really captures the um, if if you did this I'm not going to be the first person to say maybe not in this room but. Um, I'm going to be the first person to say that we really need this expectation to be exact, and we really need this exponentially many different um, variations in, in money. Because, but one of the consequences that this model could have and that we're exploring is when you do one of these computational economics models, like auctions, and people are interested in things like hardness of approximation of auctions. Um, you're really going to have agents that behave this way and maximize their, ex their exact expected utility. They don't approximate. Um, so we're really assuming that I care about these differences in utility. And it's going to have interesting or could have implications for this <laughs> economic cryptography models and um, algorithmic game theory. Yeah, Andre. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So you just read uh, next slide. Uh, no. <laughs> this slide? Yeah. Yeah. Or something I didn't uh, understand. So N itself is a, um, so is a deterministic I'm, Turing I'm, machine? It's a non deterministic Turing machine. So I'm playing um, a bit. Um, I'm <laughs> here, M is a function of X and Y. And as a function of x and y, it's polynomial time. Uh -huh. But as a function of x, it's a non-deterministic Turing machine. Oh, OK. OK. Yeah. So y is the non-deterministic. Yeah. Um, when, when I define uh, um, rational proofs with two rounds and more, um, it's going to be an, an important characterization that I can't just walk down this machine um, in, in polynomial time through any of its paths. Oh, he's he's using polynomial number of coins. Okay, so I'm saying that the graph is expected. Is it the two of the S two and the graph two? Um, n you mean if if the if there was a polynomial number of outcomes from the? So I'm saying it's a pair function of those. Yeah. Is that Arthur gets the? I'm sorry. Um, yeah, Arthur gets the gets the y. It, it, it may be two randomly the payoff more or less. 
Yeah, he he always tosses the same number of coin flips. Um, it, it actually seems a lot more powerful if you use expected number of coins, right? Well, that's what I'm asking. That's what I'm asking. Uh, well, I, mean, I see, I see, I see. Right? Yeah. You allow him to use expected number of coins. Uh, that change things. We we haven't thought of that. I mean, that's because that's interesting. Do, like, you know, there's only 50% chance I'll flip the next one, and then and you can really yeah, get yeah, yeah. many many bits, right? Yeah, and if you optimize right. things back, yeah. Right, right. Um, no, yeah, that, that's that's very interesting in order to make this more powerful. Um, we, we, we do want, I, I, when I get to the end, um, there's going to be a very tight characterization of these proofs in terms of what you can do in three rounds versus four versus five, or at least um, if you could do the same things you could do in, in, if anything you could do in four rounds, you could also do in three. It would have very interesting complexity implications. Um, so that, that's, that's an interesting question. Okay, let me go on. Um, and the Sharpie problems, basically, we really have no classical proofs for this. This is for the ones for which we really have to give a new type of one round proof. Because if Arthur wants to know how many um, certificates accept in this machine, and Merlin knows the answer because he knows everything, it's 2 to the 301 plus 13, we really, really don't know how to give this proof. And the best way we know is to give all the inputs to the machine and all the outputs and check all these 2 to the 301 certificates or 2 to the n um, and, and count all the ones that I accept. So this is really bad for Arthur. He's not going to count it. He could do it himself if he had all the time in the universe. So our tools from computer science are not helping us here. What we're going to need to do, because we're in this rational model, is bring tools from economics. So we're going to have economics to the rescue. And who will rescue us now? Um, <laughs> um, you will, and, um, and, and Brunemeyer and Wrong will, <laughs> will tell us why all our markets are wrong. But no, no, no that's, that's a great question, though. Because I do want to pause in this slide. I know I've been saying that a lot, but um, it's, it's a great audience. Um, it, no, it's a good question who will rescue economics because this is a result that can be interpreted to be in these interactions between computer science and economics that has been very, very popular in the last 10 years. But it's also a very rare type of result because a lot of the, a lot of the techniques in the area are applications from computer science to economics. So if you take things like um, hardness of computing equilibria or um, hardness of auctions, or even these new papers on, um, on markets, there it's basically, oh, this is what you can and cannot do in economics. Because if you could solve any game, you could solve any people problem. And that would be ridiculous under complexity assumptions. And what we're doing here is taking this technique from economics and building a new type of proof that will give us some very interesting characterizations of, um, of counting problems. So that's going to be our main result. It's not going to be an application of computer science to economics. It's going to be tools from economics that help us understand counting problems better. So it's not very common to the best of my knowledge. So Sure. Right. So just think about it and the fact that there's exponentially many values it would be possible for me to just ask uh, Merlin to tell me if there are uh, solutions or not. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, then just randomly guess a satisfying assignment to the formula, mm -hmm. which I will skip with probability one and two to the end. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so that's where, but that's really critical that we are playing the game of uh, exponential 
Wait, can you, can you repeat your question? Yeah. And so, so yeah, yeah. So, so you could yeah, you could throw. Yeah, yeah. That would be a rational proof. And and that if that is. Yeah. 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 And. Yeah. And as as I said, um, as I said, I'm going to be the first to say that this assumption is crucial, and we can talk offline about what directions we can take, even uh, being aware that I'm basically having Merlin care about these exponential differences in reward. Um, and I think it's more important the connection to economics and the, the fact that a lot of economic models that we would like to study have these types of assumptions more than, um, uh, more than the, and the connections to complexity are also important. Because if you can study this from an economic point of view, these problems like Sharpie and others, maybe we could try to understand them better, even though um, no expert that only can see polynomial differences would be able to solve them. But yeah. Great. So economics to the rescue, because I told you this was a talk about interactive proofs, but I didn't give you the full truth. This is actually a talk about asymmetric information. So we have Arthur and we have Merlin. And what we really want is for Merlin to give some information to Arthur. And the kind of questions we ask and answer are, what is information and how do we guarantee that it's correct? So the computation view, which you're all familiar with, is that there's a verifier, a prover. And information is the output of a hard problem. So I have this really, really hard to compute function. And the information is the output of that function. And the correctness is guaranteed by a proof. But the economics view, you have very similar problems which are called principal agent problems. And perhaps the simplest of them is that information, because the tradition in economics doesn't have this notion of hardness of computation, if I want something that I don't know, I have to introduce randomness. So I have some distribution D over some set omega of states of the world. And the expert knows what this distribution is. He's a hedge fund manager. He went look for all this information. I'm investing my money with him. I don't have time to get this information. But I do want to pay my hedge fund manager to tell me the truth. So as I said, we get the correctness from the incentives. Any questions about this? It's philosophy, but yeah. And we will. But um, it's not that simple. So for Sharpie, um, the construction, we, you could repeat it for PP. Um, for, you could repeat it for PP because PP is 0, 1. For Sharpie, you have exponentially different many answers. So I can't just tell you, oh, yes, there's a solution or there isn't. For PP, you can have a, something that you say 1 or 0. So if a majority is 1, you'll be right most of the time. And if a majority is 0 and you say 0, you'll be right most of the time. But for Sharpie, I can get back to that. For Sharpie, you have uh, many different answers. And also for the counting hierarchy that we will do. And um, so that's for one round proofs. For constant rounds, um, you'll need more sophisticated proofs. So this is not something that's a great model and then there's like a one line uh, mechanism. And there's definitely um, a sophisticated mechanism when you go to more rounds and when you go to Sharpie, which has exponentially many possible answers. OK. So economics view is we really have this no notion of what it means to, for something really hard to compute. To have something that I, the, the limited person, don't know, I really need a distribution over states of the world. And how do we guarantee that this distribution is correct? We use a very, very simple type of contract that is called a proper scoring rule. So just a show of hands, who has seen proper scoring rules before? Good. So I have a, I have a bit of a primer on proper scoring rules, which are going to be an essential tool in the construction of um, these <laughs> rational proofs. So they were invented by Good and Breer in the 1950s. And uh, there's a lot of literature on them since then. 
And the example I'm going to give you is that there's this user Arthur, and Arthur wants to know the outcome of a baseball game. So the Red Sox are playing the Yankees, and there's two states of the world, either the Red Sox win or the Yankees win, and there's some true distribution of um, who will win this game. So the distribution is Boston wins with probability 60%, and New York wins with probability 40%. And Merlin, being an expert, he knows what this distribution is. Now, Arthur really wants to make some bets on this game, and he would really like for Merlin to tell him the true distribution D. But we can't trust Merlin. If we had trust, then this wouldn't be a problem. Merlin could tell us any other distribution P. And if this were the model, and if Merlin said, for example, Boston wins with probability 100%, we don't know if that's the true distribution. It should be the true distribution that Boston always wins, but he, we have no way of comparing it to any other distribution that Merlin tells us. What we really need is a handle on the truth. And in this example, the handle is going to be who won the game. So tomorrow the game happens, and Arthur sees that New York won the game, Yankees won. And now that he's observed the outcome and he has the predicted distribution P, he can reward the expert. So he gives he, the expert a reward that depends on the prediction and the outcome of the world. So if the Red Sox win, Merlin gets some reward that depends on the fact that the Red Sox won. If the Yankees win, he gets some reward that depends on the fact that the Yankees won. And Merlin being rational means that he maximizes his expected utility. So probability that Boston wins times his reward if Boston wins, plus probability New York wins times his reward if New York wins. And he chooses his action, P, to maximize his reward. And the desirable property is that he chooses his prediction to be the true distribution. And that's what it means for a scoring rule to be strictly proper or truthful. Any questions about this? Um, about the payout divergence, for example, right? Or um, yeah, so any, any, any no, distance? No, no, no. You have one distribution. You cannot say it's a payout. You mean one type of distribution? Uh, so any, 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 no, any you distance? Can this, uh, you can get this formula to do the payout divergence, right? By choosing the outcomes. Oh, the, formula, the, the formula yeah, itself yeah. can do the payout. Yeah. But yeah, so so, so the fact that, I'm that I draw a sample yeah. means that I can actually test you on all the outcomes. And yeah, um, so e every distance is going to be equivalent to one of these scoring rules. And in particular, the one I'm going to use, so wh what's going to happen is when you give me a rule, your expected reward, the thing you're maximizing or equivalently minimizing, so you're trying to minimize the distance, um, is going to be whatever, two minus the distance between your prediction and the true distribution. Yeah. I've, I've thought about this question before, like two years ago in a different setting. So I'm trying to remember. Um, Wait, sorry, what was the question? Um, oh, okay. So the value is the maximum, then the probability goes to the I'm, I'm not 100% certain, but under this um, distance interpretation, it should be the case. But I'm not 100% certain because I'm going to give a different interpretation, which is the one I've, I've been working with. Um, but I think it should be the case. OK, so we really need to define what this function S is. And um, Ankur said, for example, the KL divergence. But um, we really want something that's like a contract, that you tell me a prediction D. Here, I overloaded notation. So D is your prediction. It's going to turn out to be a true distribution, but it could be anything. And I see some state of the world, say the Yankees won. 
So I give you a reward that's two times the probability that you said that the Yankees won minus some norm of your distribution minus one. And your expected, um, actually here it's very easy to see that um, it translates to, uh, it, um, when I take the expected reward you get over all the states of the world, it translates to a distance between the probability distributions. I don't have it on the slide, but you can use your imagination. When you take expectation over omega and you multiply by the true probability of omega here, here nothing happens because x is not, x is just a dummy variable and one is just a one. And this has the property of being truthful and bounded. So you're going to want to minimize the distance between your prediction and the truth. In particular, you're going to want to see the truth. And you're going to be bounded because um, you're going to minimize, I think, the two, the two norm, the L2 yeah, the L2 distance. Um, and uh, between distributions, you really can't get um, larger than two at least, there's definitely a bound um, that's not very large. And you can play with this constant. The, the fact that applying any, any increasing linear transformation does not change incentives. So you can have a linear transformation of this rule that gives a positive bounded reward. I'm sorry? The sub oh yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's, that's our other result that I'm not going to talk about. Um, yeah. On, on your previous slides, what's the support is just two, right? Two outcomes. Yeah. On my previous slides, the support is two outcomes. And on my future slide, the support will be two outcomes. But it's not immediate that it should be two outcomes. And in fact, one thing that we haven't studied and that we would like to study is, for example, um, if this has any extension, any interesting extensions to um, to arithmetic circuits where the output is not necessarily just zero or one of our, so we're going to study basically PP and generalizations of PP where the output of our functions is zero or one. But, um, and so we use a very simple version of this. And I'm sorry, I don't know your name. I'm sorry? Nangu. Um, as he explained, the support here could be very large making this very hard to compute. and um, that will make us very, very sad. That's point number two here. Also, if the support is large, the distribution might be very, very hard to communicate. Um, that's a different um, result in this paper that we have, that we study um, scoring rules that are um, efficient. And we show that all the ones people knew, I'm going to take a, oh, well. Um, basically, all the scoring rules that people used they never thought of computation. So people did not use this for distributions with large support, but they didn't try to seek alternatives. And we show all deterministic scoring rules. Um, actually using um, Turan's theorem comes in the proof. Um, all deterministic scoring rules require um, a linear number of queries to this distribution, which um, has a very, very large support. But we actually get a randomized scoring rule that makes only two queries to distribution. I mean, one thing is that that's a nice thing to do. You turn it into something kind of like a that, That's exactly what we do. And, um, but nobody noticed this before. That was actually our first result in this area. And iterating, we got something on um, complexity theory. But um, <sighs> OK. I'm. Um, I know that time is a bit flexible, but let's go on with the proof. So we want to give a proof to a Sharpie problem. And what we're going to do is we're going to reduce it to a question about probabilities. So instead of the number of accepting certificates of their non-deterministic Turing machine M, we're going to ask what's the probability that a uniformly random certificate accepts. And uh, Merlin, being all powerful, can easily transform his answer of 2 to the 301 plus 13, 2, 2 to the 300 plus 1 plus 13 over the total number of um, possible certificates. And what we need for a rational proof, if Merlin knows this probability Q, we need to incentivize him to reveal Q. 
Any questions about this? This is a bit standard. Counting problems are probability problems. So we're going to apply a scoring rule. So our state of states of the world is going to be 0 and 1, even for Sharpie problems, not necessarily limited to PP problems. And we're going to have to define what this distribution is that I want to learn from the expert. And the distribution is going to be simply the probability that the outcome is 1 is the probability that I walk down one of the paths in my Turing machine and end up at a 1. So, and, and, and the Turing machine accepts. And Merlin knows this distribution that I just defined. He's infinitely powerful. He can walk down all these paths and count exactly how many accept. But as I said before, and this is going to be important um, for multiple rounds, we need to have a handle on the truth. Right now, Merlin could say any distribution, and there's no way that Merlin can reward him. We really need a handle on the truth. And for Sharpie machines, the handle on the truth is going to be this sample that we can take from this non-deterministic machine just by having a walk down a random path and ending up at either a 1 or a 0. So with that sample in hand, we can give a rational proof for Sharpie. So Merlin will say some distribution p, which is equivalent to some number of accepting paths. Arthur will give some reward. And because the reward is a scoring rule, so he uses our Breer scoring rule. Merlin will be incentivized to say the true distribution, which is equivalent to a number of accepting paths. So that's a rational proof for Sharpie. You seem a bit confused. So. Any questions about this? So once you know what a scoring rule is, it's a new technique that we introduced, but Given scoring rules, this is a simple proof. It's not as simple as the proof you suggested for PP, which is just 1 or 0, and um, just say whatever you think the majority bit is, and um, I'll pay you only if that, that actually comes to pass. I need the scoring rules to get the full exponential um, possible outcomes of the Sharpie problem. How far you are from the, and um, that's, um, that's, uh, yeah. You'll probably not get in it, but you still have this expectation, right? So there's this small probability that you will. Um, it seems to me that that's a bit equivalent to what we're doing, because we are kind of sampling one string, and then basically paying you according to a distance between. Uh, R strings and the distribution you gave you gave me, and um, so it seems that it's equivalent to a scoring rule. Um, and one thing that we we do prove is that we we give rational proofs for this very large set called the counting hierarchy, and we show that um, anything in the counting hierarchy has rational proofs using scoring rules, and that the only things for which you can give rational proofs with constant rounds is the counting hierarchy. So for any problem for which you give me a rational proof, I can give you a rational proof with a scoring rule. OK. One interesting thing and about, and you yeah. Um, can you repeat that or? Well, I mean, so when you like generalize it to like multiple. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll get to that. And um, okay. but one thing to note about this um, one round proofs, and this is for a proof of Sharpie. It's not going to apply to our general proofs. Um, but one thing is that it's zero knowledge, and by zero knowledge, um, I mean that basically 
the only information that Arthur is getting is this probability distribution P, which is completely equivalent to the number of accepting paths in the machine. So he asks a Sharpie question, and Merlin simply tells him, here's the number of accepting paths. No more information about this question. So, yeah, what I'm saying is, yeah, I'm saying Merlin doesn't need to give him any extra information. And this is easy to see when Arthur is, um, when Arthur is honest. And we really haven't defined a model when Arthur is dishonest. And another, another thing is that it's computationally sound. So the length of the extra certificate, so computationally sound proofs were invented by Kilian and Michali back about 15 years ago, um, or maybe 20 by now. Said. Um, so, um, and uh, basically, the idea was if I hire you to prove a theorem for me, I don't want to have to spend polynomial time verifying that theorem. I really want to spend a short amount of time. I want a short certificate. And here, the certificate doesn't even exist. You just give me the answer. So you can imagine a universe for rational proofs. I also require some extra communication with you. But that's not the case. I require zero extra communication. Great. So we made you the first theorem with 50 minutes in. And if I stop now, this is an interesting model. And once I tell you what a scoring rule is, it's a bit obvious that I can um, start getting a lot of power from this model. And even if I didn't, um, what's really interesting is that this is a pretty tight characterization. That when I only have one round, I'm only going to give you rational proofs for sets in NP to the Sharpie. And if you notice, there's a P to the Sharpie on this side. And I have to clarify that it's P to the Sharpie when I can only make one query to Sharpie. Um, because if I make more than one query, I'm a polynomial time machine. I make my first query. I ask Merlin, what's the answer to the Sharpie problem? He gives me an answer. And then keep walking towards my output. If I made a second query, that will be a Turan proof. So, but the point of this is we also get rational proofs with one round for the polynomial hierarchy. Because of technicalities, we don't know and actually don't think that, the po that PP contains the polynomial hierarchy. It's P to the Sharpie with one query contains the polynomial hierarchy. And, but what's really interesting is this right result. And a pithy quote is, there are things money can't buy. So as somebody who is interested in economics, this is interesting to me. Because this might be the key to a whole new area of algorithmic game theory, which is we can give a computational limit on the contracts that we can write. So if I hire you to do a task for me, I can't hire you to do an arbitrary task if I'm computationally limited. I can only hire you to do a task that reduces to some problem in NP to the Sharpie. If I hire you to solve a problem in non-deterministic exponential space, I probably can't write a one round contract with you that I pay you and I trust that you do the right thing and I can enforce my payment or compute it in polynomial time. Well, the definition is that you have to be able to verify the solution. The definition is that I, I have to compute my payment yeah. to you. I don't verify what you did. I compute my payment to you in polynomial time. Um, and when you are in quantified field, you are in like yeah. Um, yeah, all these inclusions, um, all these inclusions, we don't know if they're strict or not. Um, if you see an inclusion, it means it might be strict, it might not be. Um, I'm not in the business of proving strict inclusions. I am, but um, if I did, uh, um, this would be a very different paper. <laughs> okay, so let me prove to you. I already gave an informal proof that P to the Sharpie is in RMA1, at least with one query. Let me prove to you that NP to the Sharpie 
And here, this is polynomial in many queries to Sharpie. The moral still stands anyways about contracts and computational limitations. So, yeah. I'm sorry? Um, before, before what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, sure. Yeah. I mean, it's 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 a tangential question, but I don't think once you introduce the rational proofs model, whether it's clear that RMA1 was trivial in p-space, although you'll see from this proof that anybody could, or you know, not anybody, but um, once you write this proof, you'll see that it's clearly in a pitch with Sharpie and also in p-space. No, why, why? Even RMA in general, how is it? Yeah. And and yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and that, that's actually in the paper, basically, if you have polynomial in many rounds, RMA doesn't give you more power than IP. And uh, if RMA with polynomial in many rounds. And that's why we're focusing on constant rounds. OK. So this definition again, now for languages. If you have any questions, speak now. Um, otherwise, I'm going to move a bit um, faster. But basically, the key to me writing this definition again is because I define what it means for a language to have one round proof. Now I need to show that any such language is in NP to the Sharpie. And the key here is going to be that I need to really find this certificate that maximizes the reward. Once I find it, I can compute this polynomial time predicate easily. So how do we do that? We can overload notation and define f of y to be the expected reward on this problem when you give me a certificate y. It only takes exponentially many values. I can compute this f of y exactly in p to the sharp p for any given y. So I can compute the expectation of each bit by going to sharp p and writing out this reward function and writing out a Turing machine that computes the bit of the reward function and counting the ones and zeros. And then we can non-deterministically choose y star maximizing f, f of y. So we can do some binary search over these computations I do in P to the Sharpie. So this whole process I can simulate in NP to the Sharpie. And given this certificate, I can compute the predicate in polynomial time. So that's why rational proofs with one round are in NP to the Sharpie. Okay. So these are results so far for one round proofs. And if you see a D here, it means discrete because we have in the paper proofs for languages and proofs for functions. So D is the formal notation for it's a proof for languages. And we show that unless terrible or wonderful things happen, the polynomial hierarchy collapses, we're really more powerful than classical Merlin Arthur but we only use one round. And if we have more rounds, we really want to see the power of this model that I introduced in the, um, in the introduction. And our next question is, what about RMA2, RMA3, RMA64? Where are these? So we already showed that RMA1 is very high up here in P space. And we argued informally that um, all of RMA is in P space, but where inside p-space do this RMAK fit? And the answer is the counting hierarchy. Um, I'm I'm out of time, but sure, I I definitely don't have more than ten more slides. Yeah. So who has seen the counting hierarchy before? Okay. 
that there was a lot of work on this back in the late 80s. And there, there has been some recent work on it as well. But let me define it for you. Basically, because it's a hierarchy, we have to define a base level of the hierarchy and then recurse. And it's going to be an analog of the polynomial hierarchy, but where PP takes the role of NP. So the base level is PP. So again, as with our definition of sharp P, there's this non-deterministic machine M that takes us inputs an X and a Y. And now instead of counting how many of the Ys end up in an accepting computation, we ask, are there more Ys than accept than Ys that reject? So are there more green boxes than red boxes in this slide? That's the base case. The base case is PP. And then we need to recurse. So by recursion, we're going to say that the second level of this counting hierarchy is PP with a PP oracle. But this is going to be a special PP oracle because what I'm going to do is I'm going to have this PP machine that counts, decides whether there are more green boxes than red boxes. But when I do my walk down this, down this path and I reach a box, that box isn't going to have a one or a zero. It's going to have a PP computation inside that's going to give me the one or a zero. So when I reach the end of the walk, I need to call a PP oracle just once. Yes, so it's analogous to um, threshold circuits. And you can have majorities of majorities of majorities. So you can have a majority of um, the k minus one level of the counting hierarchy is the kth level of the counting hierarchy. And this is a characterization given by Toran. The original definition was by Wagner, who gave a different um, thing. And I'm going to get to this in the last five minutes I have, because I think this is the most exciting part of this, and it could have very interesting applications to complexity theory. And a result is that, any questions about basically what the intuition of this counting hierarchy is? Great. So remember that we're actually trying to study these rational proofs with multiple rounds of interaction, and a result is that Rational proofs with k rounds contain the kth level of the counting hierarchy and are contained in the k plus first level of the counting hierarchy. So this is a very, very tight characterization of what this counting hierarchy is in terms of this interactive proof. Um, and this is exciting because we actually don't know that much about the counting hierarchy. So an open question is, does it collapse? Another open question, which is not in this slide, is does it have a separation relative to an oracle? So we know the polynomial hierarchy has a separation relative to an oracle, and that's, beca that's because of a result um, about AC0 circuits um, long, long ago that was and there was an analogy that gave this oracle separation. But for TC0 circuits, such a result would, um, would go against the natural proofs barrier. So this is actually a problem that's much harder than just saying, oh, this is a hierarchy. And the old analogy of whether CH collapses or not, our intuition would say, well, if it, if it behaves like the polynomial hierarchy, Polynomial hierarchy, I just write NP, NP to the NP, NP to the NP to the NP. And here I write PP, PP to the PP, and so on. If they behave similarly, then we don't believe that the counting hierarchy collapses. But these new results that the counting hierarchy can be characterized by rational merlin arthur proofs with constant rounds say that the counting hierarchy could collapse if it behaved like the Arthur Merlin hierarchy, which collapses to the second level. So each of these is analogous to a rational proof with k rounds. So this characterization is exciting because it could give us a new intuition and new tools to grasp this counting hierarchy of which we know 
very, very little information. Yeah. So, yeah, so so once we started working on this and we figured out obviously the first thing we tried was, well, why does Arthur Merlin collapse? And because you have this parallel um yeah, this part is amplification with Arthur, but that really sorry, with Merlin, but that really depends on um yeah. Um so so I have to say in answer to your question and, and when people ask me what do I believe, I say I believe this. Because obviously the first thing we tried is trying to repeat that proof and it didn't work for exactly the reason you suggested. Now for arithmetic circuits, I mean there is a sort of collapse, right? In some sense, right? Uh, like this uh, sort of Maninka. Um I'm not familiar with the literature on arithmetic circuits, but that that's one interesting direction because Um, but so this is something that this is something that we did work on just to try it and see what would happen. Um, one thing that might be interesting in the future is looking at questions in arithmetic circuits, and instead of using the scoring rule on choose choose states, we could have a scoring rule on um, where the states were all the possible outputs of your circuit, and see if there will be interesting results in rational proofs for arithmetic circuits. But that's speculation. We really haven't looked at it and started or started looking at what interesting questions there are. Okay, so the contributions that I presented were basically a new complexity class, which gives us very short proofs for counting problems and a tight characterization of this counting hierarchy in terms of these rational proofs. And I want to point out, as I said before, that all our rational proofs are using these proper scoring rules. So we do have to um, manipulate them so you can, so you don't have the problem of me lying to you today so I get a better reward tomorrow. But all that we use to incentivize the expert are these very simple contracts. And we think that there are some exciting directions, not only maybe um, characterizations of basically rational proofs with oracles. And so even though this intuition is unfair, um, one could try to use rational proofs with oracles. It's a hard problem because you run into all these barriers um, and it's, a, it's an ambitious problem and a hard problem. Um, but if you can show that there are things that if you can show there are things that you can do in four rounds with the rational proofs that you cannot do in three rounds, it will have massive implications in uh, um, in uh, circuit theory and complexity theory, as long as all the definitions are correct. So that's it. Thank you. Oh yeah, if, if you if if basically yeah. if, if you yeah. basically if you if you toss logarithmically many coins, yeah. um, I, I I haven't thought of that. I mean, it's it's, it's, it's definitely possible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so 
Yeah. Um, so that's an interpretation that you could give and uh, I, I would generalize that even though I'm on tape and I don't want to be um, edited out of context um, that it could be about the that could be about the unreasonableness of economics um, because one implication so I, I have put a lot on the table right about when this works when this doesn't um, or, or what what assumptions we're making on what Merlin cares about um, one, one direction that we're definitely looking at is hardness of approximation for games and mechanism design. And in that setting, it's natural to assume right now that um, your agents care about these exponential differences in reward. So even though our model does really use that power to get something like PP and so on. Um, we could try to use it to turn this around and basically um, emulate the machinery of PCPs and hardness of approximation to give rational PCPs and hardness of approximation for, um, for game theory and for mechanism design. That's one direction that we're looking at. So if anything's unreasonable, you can also turn it around and say, well, what would be unreasonable to do in uh, economics models? Some way of arguing that uh, agents may care about this little extra dollar even though they get a million because they are themselves maybe competing. So uh, there is sort of a base which you know, every stupid agent can get. No, you I might also think about that. Yeah, we, we, we can also have many different variations of. Um, no, so quite yeah. clearly you can continue to. Yeah, yeah. that's not a fair interpretation. 